Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, welcome. It's great to have you here. Make sure you subscribe to Dadvice TV on YouTube. We've got lots of great stuff from industry experts here to help you better understand about kidney disease and give you some education and some tools to help you manage it and hopefully improve your quality of life. Now, speaking of great experts, tonight, back again, is our most requested, and you guys know who it is. There's A. Abby saying, yay, Dr. Rowe, good to see you. Yes, he is the author of the book, Learn the facts about kidney disease. Now, this is, in my opinion, by far the book kidney patients should be reading. And if I could change how doctors, you know, um, handle a new diagnosis of kidney disease, it would be for them to hand you this book so that you can read about kidney disease and learn that some of the things you're worried about, you don't need to be worried about. And it, that book is so easy to understand and it helps you focus on the things that matter. So let's go ahead and let's welcome our guest, Dr. Steven Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. You just stole my thunder from my talk tonight, Things That Matter. That's what we're <laughs> going to talk about, folks, about diet and your kidneys, what matters and what doesn't matter. That's what I'm here to help you understand. Uh, I always love being on your show, James, and uh, I have to tell the audience that yeah, I prepare for these shows and mm -hmm. I'm always open to learning new stuff. And I think we all need to continue to learn as we get older. And I will be 75 this year. And thank God my brain's working pretty good. And I love learning and I love sharing my knowledge. And James, you give me a great opportunity to do that. And I want to thank you publicly. Hey, really? you are welcome. It is great to have you here. Everyone always feels so much better whenever you're here talking about kidney disease and you always talk about what doesn't matter and what does. And today we're going to talk about kind of diet and eating and what matters. But before we get to that, for those that are new, can you tell them a little bit about yourself? I am a retired kidney specialist over 40 years taking care of kidney patients. I started a kidney program in VA Columbia, South Carolina, and, you know, and in uh, University of South Carolina. I've done a lot of teaching, uh, lots of patient care, and lots of research. And I have over 100 uh, refereed publications. And my research on the issue of progression of kidney disease and went to start dialysis has been recognized as being some of the top articles in the field, especially on the issue of went to start dialysis. Uh, and I decided to write the book that James put up uh, because I feel that way too many people were starting dialysis way too early. And my research and those of my colleagues have shown pretty clearly that for most folks, you're better off not starting when your kidney number is over 10 and a lot of people are starting over 15. And, you know, with close follow up, a lot of folks can wait till kidney numbers are in the five range. And I've advised lots of folks. And again, you got to be followed closely. You got to have a, a kidney specialist that's willing to work with you that could delay getting on dialysis. And for some people, they never even have to go on because something else will be a cause of death way before you need dialysis. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about what most of you are involved with. And that is most of you have early stage kidney disease. And most of you are looking for information and you may find my book on the internet. And I decided to look at what else is out there for you folks. So I decided to look at some of the top books that you guys uh, and ladies uh, are looking at. And diet books tend to be real, real popular. Oh yeah. And I just, real, real, real popular. I think it's the top five or six books that anybody who was told that they have an abnormal kidney number that they go, it's the go-to thing, the diet books. And, and I got some problems with them and I'm gonna share my problems uh, about them. Some of them are fine. And I'll tell you what's good and what's not good and what matters and what doesn't matter. And you could decide for yourselves 
uh, how you want to uh, pursue your problem. So some of them are advertised as a way to avoid dialysis. Now that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I just, you know, this whole thing about, you know, scaring people saying, you know, you got to eat this diet to avoid dialysis is just absolutely wrong. Why is it wrong? Because over 90% of you are never going to face the issue of dialysis or kidney transplantation because you have a relatively high number on your kidney number and it's going to remain stable for years, if not decades. Uh, the other thing uh, is that um, some of these say stop progression of incurable kidney disease, another scare tactic. I mean, I don't get it. What do they mean by incurable kidney disease? First of all, most of you just have an abnormal lab finding. It's your EGFR. Now, we nephrologists made a big mistake. We decided to call it chronic kidney disease, and we've given it numbers, stage one, two, three, four, and five. What a huge mistake. Lots of my colleagues agree with that because stage one and two is not kidney disease unless you have protein in your urine of a significant amount. And stage three, which is less than 60, a lot of labs don't even report a number above 60. So don't even worry about that number at all. And if you're in the 60 range, let's break it down. Stage three is 30 to 60. Let's break it down, which I think is reasonable into two pieces. It's arbitrary, an A and a B. 3A would let's say is 45 to 60. 3B is 30 to 45. Now, if you are an older folk like me and you're in the 3B category, that may be kidney disease. But if you're in the 3A category, that may be, in other words, you're 45 to 60. That may be just per fine for your age, especially if you don't have protein. Yeah, I, I, it, to me, and it took me a while to understand this, those stages do not take into account age and they don't talk about protein leakage, which in your book, you talk about how that is the main indicator of future problems. I have to correct you, James. The, the, the classification, the staging has, has included uh, protein in the staging. So, they, they, so it's well known. I mean, this, um, this is not something that's obscure. It's well known that if you have, let's say, a, uh, a real high urine protein, but you're, let's say, you know, you up in the eighties or nineties on your GFR versus somebody who's even got a, you know, 40 or 50 or 30, uh, you may be at a higher risk of losing your kidney function. So the protein is massive. If you yep. have the higher protein with the higher kidney number and, but to say it's an incurable disease, it's really not an incurable disease. It's a risk factor. And we're going to get into that in detail. You having an elevated creatinine or decline in your EGFR is a risk factor for getting blood vessel disease. And we're going to get into it uh, in a bit. So um, I, I would say, and there's another book that talks about meal plans by stage. This is nonsense. And we're going to talk about what matters in terms of your stage and your diet. There is no, in, in, in essence, unless you're, let's say, below 30, which is stage four, or below 15, which is stage five, you're good with regular diet. Go get a cookbook. And these, I have no problem if you want to buy a cookbook, but don't buy it because you've got an incurable disease or you think it's going to get you to avoid dialysis that you never was going to be in your future anyway. Know what you're doing. I have no problem buying a book for for. For recipes, I'm all for recipes, especially if they're plant-based recipes, mm -hmm. which is what we're going to talk about, which is which is what all dietitians that are worth their salt will recommend for you, you know, plant-based diets. And then I have another book on kidney cleanse. I it, This is below me and James to even entertain that. It is absolute nonsense. Please avoid all that uh, woo-woo, okay? I want to introduce something that I think is a real useful way to look at life and look at science and look at what you're going to do about your problem. It's called the effect size, right? So people say, well, you know, 
I don't want any protein because it's going to keep me from going on dialysis. Nonsense, nonsense. There, there, things will have an effect on you, but things will have a different size of an effect depending upon who you are. And I just was talking about this with James. Let's say, and I, and I gave you an example a minute ago. Let's say that you have a GFR 60, but you've got a couple grams of protein in the urine. Mm -hmm. Well, you are at risk, no question about it. And so I can demonstrate an effect on somebody like you if something is really going to work because you are going to otherwise lose your kidney function. Yeah. And, and the effect size is and, and things that influence it. Now, we know things that will influence that situation control and blood pressure that definitely has an effect big effect size uh controlling your your um using the right drugs using the aces and arbs that we've talked about a lot that has an effect size especially if you've got a good bit of protein in the urine one thing we'll talk about this i think i'm going to have a, a session on blood sugar and your kidneys one thing that most of you probably don't know whether you're diabetic or you're not diabetic, is that we have not been able to really demonstrate any effect size on your kid on, on, on blood vessel disease, which is what we're going to talk about mostly tonight. Because your your main risk is not kidney failure, it's getting a heart attack, getting a stroke, getting blood vessel disease. And controlling your blood sugar tight A1C has not been demonstrated to improve that. Um, but if you are diabetic, all the things we're talking about tonight in terms of lifestyle issues will have a much bigger effect size on you than if you're non-diabetic and you've got an, a, a CKD 3A, 3B, or CKD 4, or what have you. Um, those of you who are really geeky and want to go and look at source material, I happen to read something uh, today that's open source meaning you can get it it's free it's a journal called kidney 360 it's one of the journals that comes out of my uh, american society of nephrology the american kidney organization and it's got a great title modifiable lifestyle behaviors and progression of ckd real interesting paper so i, I recommend it to you so in in my opinion and, and I'm not the only one. I mean, I've got a lot of colleagues that, that agree with my opinion. The effect size of diet is much, so, much, much smaller um, on your survival or on your kidney progression than other things that you can do, other healthy behaviors, other lifestyle behaviors. So the obsession with diet is misplaced. And the low protein, I'll just tell you right away, low protein, it's all relative and we're going to dig into it a little bit more, but you're probably eating at least hundred grams of protein. An average American diet, probably most of the Western world, we eat way too much protein. And I'm going to get into the smart diet, which I made up the name. <laughs> it's in my book for you folks with kidney disease. Everybody goes, where'd you get smart diet? I said, I pulled it out of the air because I think it's smart. And there you I'll go. <laughs> to follow that kind of diet. Um, uh, it's relatively low in protein, and, we'll, and we're going to dig into that in a minute. And you, and again, James has told you this over and over. There's no magic pill, uh, and uh, there's no way to get away from the hard work of lifestyle <laughs> changes, okay? Well, I wish there was a pill for all that, but there's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just hard work, ladies and gentlemen. So diet, in my opinion, uh, and I think that the evidence bears it out, your diet uh, especially for your kidneys, has a much smaller effect size than blood pressure control, getting you to the right goal blood pressure. Using ACEs and ARBs if you got protein in the urine. And James has a, a doc tomorrow night that's going to talk about some of the new drugs that are really game changers. They also, beyond ACEs and ARBs, especially for those of you with protein in the urine, big effects on the kidneys and on your survival living longer. So we got some good stuff for you folks. It's a quick been, question. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is our target for our blood pressure? And I'm surprised you didn't ask me. Okay. Well, James, I have to be fair to, uh, my colleagues and 
the study that has lowered the goal to let's say 110 to 120, which is what I shoot for and what I, my wife shoots for. Um, I think for diabetics, uh, we, we're not sure about it because they weren't included in the study. But if you, I would say, if you can stay around 120 to 130, that should be your goal because there's a lot of evidence that you get better survival, better uh, decrease in risk for your kidneys, for your heart, for your brain, when you get into that target range. The other thing that we got lots of data on is controlling your lipids, controlling your LDL, your bad cholesterol. And I'm all for getting it real low, like down to 60, especially if you're diabetic. Uh, and there's no controversy of exercise. I've beaten that many, many times. It, and and it, it can reduce your risk of going on, of getting kidney failure. And the benefit is there no matter what little amount you do every day. Don't give up on exercise. Start slow and increase it. And even for older folks, it may affect size. This is an interesting concept because if you say, well, let older folks have high blood pressure ranges. We used, I used to have patients running 180, James. Mm. And research proved it totally wrong. You want to, and, and I'm 75. I want to keep my blood pressure around 110 to 130. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and as you get older, your risk of dying from all these various bad things, heart attack, strokes, just goes up. So again, you got a bit bigger effect size, even if you're older with the exercise, with lowering your cholesterol, something that most people don't think about. Um, and as far as obesity and um, getting your kidneys to get worse, getting worse kidney problems, the jury's out on that, James. You'll be glad to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just think that is the number one thing my doctor is focused on right now is my weight. And I'm dropping it, which is great. <laughs> I, 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 I have come around to be less obsessed with the weight than I am with plant-based diet, which we're going to get into, controlling your blood pressure is the goal, getting your LDL in the range we talked about. I mean, diets, and we talked about this last time, diets are meant to fail. They will all fail. 90% of diets fail. I think if you can exercise with the weight you got, you're much better off than obsessing over that. If you can get your blood pressure under control at the weight you got, you're much better off. I'm not saying that we should you know, just all be massively obese. I think we need to control our weight. And if you, and if you do buy into the lifestyle stuff we're talking about, getting your blood pressure under control, doing the exercise at least 30 minutes a day, even mild to moderate, uh, straining yourself. You don't have to go, go all out. Um, you know, you, you will, uh, you will lose weight and you don't have to count calories. Now of everything you said, I've got my blood pressure under control. That was like the first thing my doctor's focused on my, my LDL. It's, it's my doctor wants me to get that down, <laughs> but everything else I'm good on, except for my weight and that, that the cholesterol, I got to get those under control. All right. Well, let me tell you, James, and I don't want to criticize your doctor, but I will say this generically. If your LDL is not in range, ask your doctor, why can't I get more of those drugs? that will lower my LDL. They will do the, the trick. You just got to use the right dose. There's lots and lots of different uh, lipid drugs that you can use. So I don't think you don't have to kill yourself on diet. That's nonsense because it's not going to work. These drugs work fine. They've been around for decades and they are beneficial. No question about it. So tell your doctor, if you're not in range, why can't I take a different drug or more of this lipid drug? Okay. I will. Just that and Pravish that and, you know, there's lots and lots of them. And um, so when I first got into this stuff, I, I wrote the book for patients, started to look on Facebook and it was just crazy, James. Uh, and you know that. Oh, yeah. All the nonsense <laughs> that... about special diet, don't eat any protein, don't eat any potassium. I mean, just absolute nonsense. There's Doesn't one, make don't, sense. no oil whatsoever. <laughs> It makes no sense. And there's, there's nothing magic about the diet. And we're going to get into what the main components are. So in my opinion, if your CKD one, probably through four is probably, 
in, in the vast majority of you, no need for a restrictive diet. They're going to be exceptions, but most of you, no need. The restricted diet will be harmful, not beneficial. Um, now let's work backwards. Let's say you are a CKD5. First of all, what is CKD5? It's less than 15. It's an arbitrary number again, right? Mm -hmm. It's no hard and fast thing. So they also called it end stage or dialysis. And they've changed that now, James. They've, they've corrected the, you know. Yeah. It, we nephrologists did learn from our mistakes. We realized that, you know, stage one and two are not kidney disease, don't report the GFRs over, over 60. And we learned we got to put the protein in, in, the, in the staging, okay? And, and we also learned that less than 15 is not dialysis. And unfortunately, too many people got put on dialysis uh, in the less than 15, and some even over 15, which is way too early. Unnecessarily, oh, yes. miserable life, painful, horrible, unnecessary. Don't let it happen to you. So, but what if you're less than five? It's not a reason to start dialysis. As I said earlier, read my book, please. If any of you who are close to dialysis, read the chapters on it about when to start and what your options are. Go over it with your doctor because a lot of you can avoid going on dialysis, delay it at a, at a minimum. Um, so here's something real interesting. I, I certainly recommend dietitians for anybody mm -hmm. when you get to stage five. You may need it earlier if you start having potassium elevation. Absolutely, no problem. I, I'm, I'm good on that. But certainly one, two, three, it's like, you're like anybody, eat what you want, pretty much. I mean, not what you want, eat the diet we're gonna talk about, the smart eat diet. Eat healthy. Eat healthy, eat healthy, absolutely, Sam. But not weird things like, hey, let me find out how much phosphorus and potassium or, you know, blah, blah. Okay. It turns out there's no doubt that there's a strong relationship because between those people that are better nursed, which is measured by lots of different ways, and dietitians know the stuff real well. And one of the, one of the markers of, of nutrition, which is not a great marker, but it's a long story, is your serum albumin. What are your blood tests? Mm -hmm. Great relationship between that and survival. And um, <clears throat> better nutrition in general means more protein, not less protein. As a matter of fact, all of the societies, the kidney societies around the world rec are recommending higher protein intakes for people on dialysis. Why? Because your nutrition goes down quickly as your kidney disease progresses. We get worse and worse nutritional states as our kidney disease progresses as our EGFR goes down. And as we age, we get worse nutrition. Our muscles waste away. That's why I go to the gym every day and work out, try to keep my muscles from totally fading away. Um, it turns out that we, we obsess with, you know, people's weight on dialysis. The people that are bigger and fatter live longer in general than the people that are skinnier. The people that are not following their diet. I'm not telling you not to follow your diet when you're on dialysis, but there's some evidence that they live longer. And here's something else. I obsessed my patients and, and, and had them take these massive pills con to control their phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And those are disgusting pills that they would take with meals and we would beat them up and we'd have charts and say, oh, this one's phosphorus is this high and blah, blah, blah. We have no proof that we were doing you any good, which is really a shame. Theoretically, if you have, and, and this happens with, with, you know, when your kidneys go real low, like, you know, 15, 10, 5, your phosphorus is going to go up. And then theoretically, it could cause you to have calcifications in your blood vessels, which is not a good thing. Of course, that can lead to heart attacks and maybe even strokes. But the evidence is not good for that. And, uh, in general, you're better off with more protein than less protein, certainly as you get to dialysis. And those people, like I said, who had the larger weight gains, and, and listen, for sure, your potassium is dangerous. It can kill you. So you got to be careful with your potassium. No, no doubt about that. And you got to be careful with your weight gains when you get to dialysis and if you're not making urine because you can you know, go into heart failure and not be able to breathe. No doubt about that. Those are, those are undoubted. And you need dietitians are great to help you with potassium, to help you with the weight gains, help you with the fluid gains. Um, and 
you know, the reason for this whole thing is it has to do with the parathyroids, which is another talk, which I won't get into tonight. Um, no need for these phosphate binders. If, certainly, if you're not on dialysis, absolutely no need to be on phosphate binders. You could tell your doctor that he needs to look it up because that's the current opinion. Any questions before we move to potassium? Any? Nope, everyone's thrilled with what you're talking about. Okie doke. All right. <laughs> so now potassium is another one. They say, oh, I don't need any potassium if you got stage three nonsense. Stage four, probably nonsense. Um, you need to get your blood work done periodically. And if you're one of these folks, and, and there are people with earlier stage that have high potassiums. And there's reasons for that, which I'm not going to get into. It's called hypoaldosteronism. And there's ways to treat it medically. But most of you who run high potassium is because of the medicines you're taking. Your doctor has to look at your list of medicines, and there are certain medicines that are typical for raising your potassium. So a lot of it is just because of what you're doing, the medicines you're taking, and it's not that you need to go on a totally restricted diet. But if, if your potassium's running high uh, and it's not your medicine, you absolutely get your dietitian to help you figure out the right foods to eat. I'm not saying everybody should eat plant-based high potassium diets because that's the diet we're, we're gonna advocate tonight is a plant-based diet, which is definitely high in potassium. Um, now, you know, the smart diet that I'm gonna get into is probably good for everyone other than some stage four with, that have a little potassium problem and, and a lot of stage five. So then you gotta start thinking a little bit more carefully about restricting potassium. So what matters? What matters is um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I'm glad like you did it. not ask me to say it. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. What does that mean? That means disease of your blood pressure, uh, blood vessels. Um, now, uh, so CKD, as we've talked about on the show a bunch of times, is a risk factor, just like blood pressure is a risk factor to get a heart attack or a stroke, just like smoking, big time risk factor, just like high cholesterol, big time risk factor. And, and as we said earlier in the talk tonight, diabetic beyond being a risk factor is a disease equivalent. What does that mean? If you've had a heart attack, you, you're, you're at a much higher risk than someone who's never had one. Or if you had a stroke, you're much higher risk of, versus someone who's never had one of having another problem. Being diabetic is like having had one of these events. So, and so the, the effect size for diabetics is going to be much larger for all of these lifestyles. Really crucial. You can clearly increase your lifespan by taking them on, including the diet. Diabetics are three to four times the risk of getting a stroke or a heart attack versus non-diabetics. Now, as far as the, um, GFR, uh, it's, it's a much smaller risk factor than smoking, than controlling blood pressure, and maybe even your, your cholesterol, but it is a risk factor. And the risk goes up as your kidney number goes down and as your protein number goes up, you get a higher risk of getting these bad things, all right? But it's a lifelong thing. You're not gonna reverse your hardening of the arteries no magic pill, no special diet, there's no reversing it. You're slowing it down. No matter what your age, it's worth trying to slow it down. No vitamin, no pill, no probiotic, nonsense, nothing. It's what you're gonna do, folks. What you're gonna do is you're trying to decrease the buildup of that plaque on your arteries, which could lead to the chest pain and heart attacks. Quick list of symptoms for those of you who don't know them. You may get pain in your jaw. You may get pain in your fingers. Woman may get shorter breath. A woman may just have decrease of energy. A lot of women, uh, doctors miss the heart attack. Their symptoms are, are atypical. And that was something I recently learned just a few months ago is that the symptoms between men and women can be different for heart very, attacks. Yeah, very different. You may, a woman may just be short of breath. You may just feel tired and weak. I mean, it may not be the typical crushing a chest pain, like an elephant on your chest. Mm -hmm. That's the classic heart attack sign. 
<clears throat> uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, these clots to the brain and little pieces off your artery in your neck called the carotid uh, that can have plaques in the artery and that can flip off to the brain causing a stroke. That's called embolic. And um, one of the things that may tip you off that it's coming is called a TIA. What does that stand for, James? TIA. No clue. <laughs> I... Okay. Transient, which means short-lived, like hours, minutes to hours. Ischemic, uh, TI, uh, transient. I is the ischemia, means lack of blood and attack, like a heart attack. Okay. It's like a, a brain. A temporary attack. lack of, so is that like a sudden drop in blood pressure or something? Well, that could do it. A decrease in flow to your brain and you start having like trouble speaking, your face looks different. Uh, you may have trouble with one of your extremities, you can't move it. That may be a signal that you're going to have a, a stroke. So mm. those are just some things for you folks to know about. The other uh, part of the body typically affected by hardening of the arteries is your extremities, uh, your legs. And some of you may get uh, as you walk, you may get a certain distance. You get cramping in the back of your calf. That could be due to lack of blood flow there. Now, here's something real interesting, James, that I really just recently thought about. So all of these things that we're talking about to lower your risk of atherosclerosis, they work for even older folks and maybe even more so. Because like I said, the um, effect size may be bigger because older folks have lots of potential to die of heart attacks and strokes. So you want to decrease the plaque in your arteries. And also what you're going to do, if you can take on these lifestyle things and decrease the plaque in your arteries, you can decrease that plaque in the blood vessels to your kidneys. Mm. And the main way us older folks get decline of kidney function is not the protein in the urine type, which we call glomerular type, it's the blood vessel type. It's the hardening of the arteries type. So you may be doing yourself a favor in all kinds of ways by taking on the lifestyle and the diet that we're talking about. Uh, sodium restriction is good for all diets, including stage five, including being on dialysis. And if you eat less sodium, less salt, you will push out less protein in your urine. And as we've discussed, that's the biggest factor that will determine whether you're at risk to go on dialysis. So a decrease the sodium and the salt uh, may decrease the protein and slow your kidney progression down. Probably a lot more important than going crazy over extremely low protein. Mm -hmm. Low sodium may be a lot more important, but this never gets never gets the respect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you eat a lot more sodium, it's got other bad effects, eating lots of salt, which is all our processed food, all our fast food. It can lead to calcium loss with kidney stones and thinner bones called osteoporosis, right? And as you know, James, the things that are highest in sodium are the processed foods, mm -hmm. the hot dogs, the sausage, the Chinese food. <laughs> and you want to try to restrict to about 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. Which so is I saw <laughs> at the store about a month ago yeah. um, a claim jumper TV dinner, and it wasn't very big, and it had over 3,200 milligrams of sodium. In yeah. one little TV dinner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Quarter pounder. A quarter pounder has about half your day's amount of sodium. Chicken sandwich. All the fast food. Bread, rolls, pizza. Um, so the DASH diet, which, you know, I on your show, I've learned more and more about diet. So the DASH diet is the dietary approach, DASH, dietary approach to stop hypertension. DASH, right? It's like, it's basically my smart diet which is a Mediterranean plant-based diet mm -hmm. with an emphasis on the sodium. They push the sodium to 1200. I think that's unrealistic. If you can uh, like one th 1200, if you could do 2000, I think you're doing okay. 
knowing that one teaspoon of salt is already 2300 but, <laughs> but but that's not what you I get gave up the- eating salt straight out of the the little blue thing with the girl in the umbrella <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean most of it is coming from you know crazy chinese food dishes that are going to easily be over 2000 to 3000 well, and uh, or, pizza. Or, 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 if, back pizza. in the pizza. day, if I ate some pizza all night, I was up thirsty because of all that sodium in the sauce and the pepperonis and the sausages and everything else. So, I mean, if you're going to do something that matters, try to restrict your sodium and try to get into the plant based. Before we get into my smart diet, can't avoid or, or not mention exercise. It's generally much more important than weight loss. I'll repeat, exercise regularly is generally much more important for weight loss to prevent early onset of hardening of the arteries with strokes and heart attacks and trouble with flow to your legs and uh, progressive kidney problems. It is much more important. And, you know, you've got control that 80% of the outcomes that could happen, the bad things that could happen, this is somebody's calculation. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but you have a lot of control over bad things that are gonna happen to you by taking on the lifestyle things we're talking about and taking on the things that we've already discussed as far as your blood pressure, your, your LDL, you know, the smoking. You, you can control a lot of your health outcomes. Um, and, uh, now a, uh, exercise is probably uh, now exercise is, is up there, but probably the highest, uh, benefit you're going to get is stopping smoking. No, hands down biggest risk to all of these bad, uh, hardening of the arteries, bad outcomes. Um, and, um, let's talk about my smart diet. So because I want to get a few minutes for questions. Mm-hmm. It's in my book. It's a chapter on my smart diet. Um, most of you folks we talked about, you're already eating about 100 grams of protein a day. So if you can get down to around 60, you're doing good. And that's what's roughly in my diet, depending on your weight. 60 to 80 gram protein diet. And again, just to reiterate, the evidence about going on these low protein diets there was a good review of all of the literature in 2018 about diets. And there's lots of small studies. The one, the one randomized control st- study found no benefit. It was called the modification of diet and renal disease. It was a massive NIH study, no benefit. But there's smaller studies that showed some benefit. But if you look at all the studies together and you compare higher and lower protein, no benefit. There is like real small study that shows very low protein may benefit you, but that's a real small study. And the effect on the quality of your life to eat something like, instead of eating 100 grams, to eat 10 or 20, that's insane. And to take these supplements, it's insane. The only time I would even consider recommending it, the supplements and the real low protein diet, is if you're young, you've got a lot of protein in the urine, and you're willing to try a really low protein diet in addition to all the other things, all the drugs that you should be on, the lipid drugs, the ACEs, the ARBs, the, the new drugs that Doc's going to talk about tomorrow night. And I will talk about another show. You do everything else and you want to take on an, an extremely low protein diet and keto and lugs. The only time I would endorse that is a young folk with lots of protein in the urine. Otherwise, absolutely no place for the 99% of you out there. All right. So um, we're getting close to the end. We're going to get some questions soon. Um, and I've been marking a bunch of them. We got quite a few. <laughs> so your healthy diet in general, if you eat a plant-based diet, you could decrease your mortality by about a third. How's that for impressive? No fancy low protein, no supplements, no probiotics. No, no cleanse, no kidney cleanse. No flush, no, no kidney cleanse. flush. No flush or anything. Just a healthy plant-based diet with a little bit of a DASH diet, a little low in sodium. Mm-hmm. It can lower your risk of kidney progression. 
you get less acids in your body, which may be a benefit for your kidneys. You'll, you'll be eating less because if you eat uh, fruits and vegetables that are high in fiber, it's going to make you feel fuller quicker. You eat no sugars, they shoot your sugar up, drop it down, and you get hungry within minutes. You all know that. You, you experienced it. So if you can eat more of a plant-based diet, it will help your weight. It will help your hardening of the arteries. It'll help with the acids. It'll help your diabetes risk. And it'll help your blood pressure. And simple, don't go crazy over calories. Look at my uh, talks on dad advice on various diets. I think the best diet is portion control. Mm -hmm. You can, uh, we talk about the plate method on some of my earlier talks. No need to count calories. You can have one glass of wine, it's all cool. Uh, but remember, too low protein, you're gonna get malnourished and that's not gonna be good for you. And try to eat less red meat and you'll get plenty of fiber if you eat in fruits and vegetables. Stay away from the sugary drinks, they are poison. They should have a skull and crossbones on them. They are poison. Don't let your kids drink them, they are poison. They will really mess up your sugar, give you diabetes, and, and just make you fat and not have any benefit. The fiber is amazing. Decreases mm -hmm. your concentration, lowers your blood sugar, uh, decreases colon cancer, decreases irritable bowel. Eat lots of those fiber vegetables. It will help all that. Stay away from, uh, here's what you stay away from if you can. The bagels, pizzas, crackers, biscuits. <laughs> white rice, tortillas, muffins, pretzels, chips, noodles, waffles. Anyway, in my book, I have a list of good things to eat. Okay. Eat. If you eat the whole foods, you'll lose weight. And, um, you know, you're, if you're diabetic and, and we'll talk about sugar and your kidneys and we'll talk about diabetes on, on one of my talks soon. Diabetics it's, if you try to restrict protein is dangerous oh, yeah. because if you're not going to eat carbs, you got fats or protein and you, and hypoglycemia, low sugar is the most dangerous thing for diabetics. Um, so don't fall for the low protein and there's no proof, no proof at all of low protein and diabetics having a benefit. Nope. So don't go for that, especially if you're diabetic. Um, and, um, getting to the end. Like I said in my book, I have suggested foods. I've got websites where you can find free recipes. Uh, no benefit to drinking more water. Everybody's talked about that. It may help some of you eat less, and I have no objection to that, but there's no real benefit to slowing the decline of kidney function. And if you want to buy these books out there that say it's for kidneys, and it's not because you know you got a fatal illness or you know you're gonna die without <laughs> buying that book, but if you want the recipes. And a lot of them are good. They're plant-based recipes. I'm good on that. As long as you know what you're doing. And so I purchased you're... probably every book that you looked up. Because there's not a lot of them. There's a good amount of them. But in the beginning, I went on Amazon and every book, I just went click, 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 ordered. Got tons of them in. The diets or the recipes, I liked those. But I'll tell you something. I started going around the internet. Every um big kidney organization has free recipes online oh, yeah. and i got a list of about 50 or 60 different websites each of them with hundreds of recipes on them that you can just go to their website and get them and it, it was more than just going to like um you know the national kidney organizations going to those local ones yeah. so many recipes and resources there to help you eat healthy yeah James, you might want to post them on, on your website. Dad yeah, they are. If you go to the top, there's a diet. It says recipes, and there's a giant list of all these sites. You go there, and you can access all their recipes. Yeah, again, I'm not opposed to you buying books that have recipes in it, but just know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yep. All right, you ready for some questions? I am ready, James. I'm ready. You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the people who make this software and find a way have you see all the ones that I star? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Can you talk about how family history plays a role in the kidney disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, and kidney disease run in our family? This is from my mom. Who has kidney disease? Oh, okay, mom. Well, that's a great question. You know, the um, I'll 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 work from the, the science to the to the basic stuff. There is a lot of emphasis on genetics and kidney disease, but so far, not a lot, not a lot out there. There are uh, a couple of links. One is so-called polycystic kidney disease, mm -hmm. which takes about a few percentage of people on dialysis have that condition. It's inherited. It's dominant. That's an important one. Um, there are, uh, in the African Americans, there's a genetic, uh, type, um, that is connected to kidney disease, but we are in the real early stages of it. And <clears throat> clearly there are families that you'll see lots of people in the same family with kidney disease. So this obviously a genetic connection, but we don't have it yet. We're not there yet. Very good. Um, a Abby. A regular, hey, A. Abby, great to have you here. I gotta learn what that A stands for. Her first A in her name. She says she had protein leak leakage, no numbers, uh, but six months later, her doctor said there's no protein leakage. Is that possible? Well, yeah, sure. So here's something uh, that you guys and girls need to know about. <clears throat> there's varying amounts of protein that could be in the urine. Now, there's a normal amount of protein that could be in the urine. And then you have something called micro, low levels of protein in the urine. And just like your kidney number will vary from one lab test to the next, so will those low levels of urine protein vary a lot from one visit to the next. So that's one way that the protein can disappear. It may never have been a significant level of protein, just like your kidney number may never have been a significant number to worry about as you repeat them over time. The other thing is there are medications that can decrease protein in the urine. And again, that's one of the main goals of kidney treatment is to give you things that can decrease the protein in the urine, which in turn is likely going to be connected to slowing the decline of your kidney function. So that, that would be how that would work. Great. Now, Heather asked, have you ever seen where a patient's kidney function declines when on an ACE inhibitor. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is predictable. And here's what the nephrology community, the experts have decided. Because if you have, let's say, two to 300 in Europe, it's about 20 to 30 because you use different measures. Uh, and certainly over 300 or over 30 in Europe and other countries. Uh, which is called macroalbuminuria, those ACEs and ARBs have proved beneficial. And some of these new drugs are clearly beneficial too uh, that we're going to talk about. You're going to hear about tomorrow. Um, and with the ACEs and ARBs, I can tell you this much. It's been well established and agreed that even if you drop 30%, you got, you got to be monitored. That's expected. But over the long term, over years, again, this is not something you're looking about a number that's 50 today and 60 tomorrow. That's nonsense. And any of these things you're, you're reading about testimonials, my number went from 50 to 60 on very low protein, or I'm doing a study on very low protein. These are anecdotal. The studies, and I was talking to James about this earlier today, mm -hmm. and, and one, of, one of my colleagues will talk tomorrow night about studies on these new drugs. These are studies done around the world with tens of thousands of feet people. And they're very expensive to do. And they're very strict in their guidelines of who's qualified, who's not qualified. And very strict in how they interpret the information. And the studies have shown that ACEs and ARBs will benefit you even if you have an initial drop of your kidney function. They'll benefit you over the longer term, especially, and I would say exclusively, if you've got a good bit of protein in the urine. If you don't have a lot of protein in the urine, it's not worth the risk of that initial drop. Uh, and I would probably stop it. Very good. Tyrone asks, does weight loss improve kidney function? You know, it's the, the jury is out on that. There are, uh, there's a study that showed no relationship. And as a matter of fact, people lost kidney function slower that had 
you know, BMIs that were in the kind of medium to a little bit chubby <clears throat> versus <clears throat> lower BMIs. Uh, other studies show, yeah. So there's no good, no good data on it. But the data is good regarding plant-based diets, re regarding decreasing sodium in your diet, regarding the other factors we talked about. So awesome. it's not it's not a critical factor, uh, in my opinion, regarding rapid loss of kidney function. Put your emphasis on the other things: stopping smoking, blood pressure control, target blood pressure, LDL, plant-based diet, exercise, exercise, exercise. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Much better a way to put your time in. Yeah, there's there's a there's another YouTuber. He's a doctor. I watch, and he always says chest compression, chest compression, chest compression. The first thing to do, we should be exercise, exercise, exercise. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I agree. absolutely. Yeah. And again, don't be discouraged. Even small amounts of exercise are going to be beneficial. Get off the couch. Get moving. If if you have any doubt about what whether you should get up and do this or that, walk around your house. Go out of your way to stretch and exercise more yep. and more. And you will, and you will enjoy it more and more. So my house is very long. It's a one story ranch and there is a restroom like right on the other side of this wall. I go all the way to the other side whenever I have to go to the restroom. And cause my, my work is right here behind me. Um, plus I recently got a sit stand desk. So I'm yeah. sitting right now because I was standing all day. Um, but all those little things help. I've got this little balance thing under my yeah. desk that I get to just kind of balance on while I'm sitting here working, which is great. All of it adds up. I love it. Uh, now, you want, go ahead, James. You, you Philip asked, you. when would you recommend a biopsy with protein in the urine? Tough, tough, complicated question. Um, I, I think I've been asked this, and here's my answer that I've given before to you folks. If your doctor, first of all, you're doing a biopsy, the first question is why? Ask your doctor, why do you want to do the biopsy? Is it going to change my treatment? That's one of the first things I would want to know. Biopsies are very low risk. And there are certain rare kinds of kidney problems that you can only diagnose with lab tests and a kidney biopsy by looking at the tissue. So it depends generally on how much protein is in your urine, what your other lab tests show, and ask your doctor, with this biopsy, is it likely that you're going to do something different than without the biopsy? And that's one thing. The other reason is it can give you a maybe an idea of your prognosis. I don't know that that's necessarily a good reason to biopsy because you can get a, a good idea of your prognosis by taking it's in my book, predicting with using certain lab data, certain blood pressure, other parameters, who is at risk of, of getting a, a more rapid decline. So those would be the reasons, change of treatment or prognosis. Ask your doctor. Very good. And do you have any thoughts on using a sauna for people who have kidney disease? Not a problem. Not a problem. Just stay hydrated. Hydration is critical. You don't have to drink gallons of water, but if you've already got kidney disease, one of the commonest ways that your kidney function can go down and miraculously get better, we've cured you, is by just <laughs> getting some fluids in when you're You were dehydrated. You're cured. <laughs> you're cured. That will cure you. You get dehydrated enough with an EGFR of 30 or 40, it can easily drop to 15 or 20 with dehydration, okay? So that's for sure. Stay hydrated. All right. Any questions you see on there as we're coming I, to the last I, I, few minutes? Okay, I'll run through a couple here. Um, atonic bladder. Uh, you know, atonic bladder is, is a urologic uh, situation. It generally, uh, it, and it's found in diabetics. That means the bladder's not contracting well. <clears throat> and uh, your urologist may have some medicines uh, that uh, can give you to help you with that. And it's fairly common diabetics. The big problem is if you've got a lot of urine in your bladder, that can cause kidney failure by backing up and causing pressure in the kidney. But that's pretty rare. <clears throat> um, portion control is good. Uh, mm -hmm. right, now, um, now, as far as uh, A, Abby, no protein, uh, I'm on an ACE. 
Yeah, I mean the aces are okay, and 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 I, I'm fine. I think an ace, <clears throat> ace aces, uh, are good blood pressure drugs. Uh, those are the prills, capipril and allopril, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And and the arbs are just as good, which would be um, uh, the um, low sart, the tans, low sartan. Um, those drugs may have a heart benefit too. Again, most of you should focus not on whether you're going to go on a kidney machine but you're trying to prevent, you try to live as long as you can and prevent the hardening of the arteries, bad outcome. And so that's, uh, that's what you really should be focusing on. Um, uh, what's the range of high and low pressure? Uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it used to be 140 was considered high blood pressure and now we're down to 130. So if you're running 130 consistently, and, and you need to check it after you relax for 10 or 15 minutes and then check it and, and make sure you're using the right technique. And if it's consistently running above 130, you need to be on medicine for sure. That's the new, uh, the new, uh, my, my top book. number stays in the one teens, which I'm very happy with my bottom number just below 90. No, I, I disagree. Sandra, if your lipid drugs are having side effects, there's a lot of them to choose from. And yeah, I mean, and the whole idea that some people have muscle pains with lipid drugs, it's really kind of dubious that the drugs actually call, but that's okay. If you're having a problem with one lipid drug and you can't get your LDL down, there's lots of other ones that I, I would recommend your doctor consider. Um, now this Robert, you, you know, your creatinine is 2.9. It's not a question to lower your creatinine. Forget that. Focus on keeping it in that range as long as you can and doing the things that's in my book. There's a lot of things I recommend in my book to try to keep you from going worse than 2.9 or whatever that, let's say roughly the three range, which is definitely likely to be three B or stage four uh, kidney disease, uh, you know, with a 2.9 creatinine and statins have been safe. They've been used for decades. They're fine. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So now, some- now here's one care yeah. asks: can strong antibiotics affect your GFR? Well, there are antibiotics that can cause kidney failure and, um, and they're well known and your doctor should know about them. And they're generally not used unless you have a serious illness. Uh, and there are antibiotics that can, it's like something like Septra, Bactrim. A lot of you may have used it for urinary tract infections. Uh, that can raise the creatinine, but not affect kidney function because it can piece. This is really going to confuse you like crazy. It can pe- so creatinine is not supposed to be secreted. It's supposed to be just be filtered, right? It's the filter. It's that number. It's that lab test that's going to measure filtration, glomerular filtration, but a little bit of it is secre- secreted <laughs> creatinine. So it's not just filtered. And uh, the septure could block it, and that could raise your creatinine and make it artificially go up. That's 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 a kind of a, a little bit in the weeds here, but I just figured you like that. Uh, palmetto, I can't say about the prostate. Uh, there's lots of good things for prostate drugs. The urologist could recommend it, and uh, uh, I. Uh, Pulse pressure, you know, there's really, you know, that's the difference between your systolic and your diastolic. Um, you know, no real uh, issue with that. Uh, other, I mean, there are rare, I'm not going to get into it, rare cardiac conditions where you have a high pulse pressure. Uh, there, diabetic kidney transplant to consider. Oh, that's a tough one. Someone's looking about a diabetic on a kidney transplant, consider pancreas transplant. We don't have enough time to get into it. But I will talk about sugars and kidneys and ask the question that night. In general, we're doing better with pancreas transplants, but that's a complicated question that I don't. Yeah, think we are out of time. Tonight. Yep. <laughs> I want to thank you, Dr. Rowe, for being here again. Another great and very educational conversation. I'd like to thank everyone out there in our audience being here with us. Please share these videos. Let's get the word out to others. They don't have to be afraid of kidney disease and doing these extreme diets or eliminating a whole bunch of stuff. You know, this is, this is someone who's been around, uh, the docs, 
worked with countless patients over decades. <laughs> you know, and done so much to help kidney patients. And these are the types of people that we need to be listening to, not all these Facebook groups. And I will be back tomorrow night with a brand new guest here for the first time, Dr. Gibney, also a retired nephrologist. And he's going to talk about many of those amazing drugs that Dr. Rowe has talked about and share some data from some of the studies that have been published. All right, Dr. Rowe, thank you so much. And I'll see all of you tomorrow night. All right. Bye, everyone.